an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! It's been a pretty torrid week for the Labour Party, again. Splits on everything from how to deal with terrorists to Trident to Ken Livingstone, culminating in a bizarre row about whether or not the Shadow Chancellor wants to scrap MI5. John McDonnell insists Britain's spies are safe in his hands, though he did admit that uh, his party has had a rough week. Are there more weeks like this ahead? Here's our Adam. It's the week that Jeremy Corbyn and his party grappled with issues of war and peace. In the wake of the Paris attacks, the Labour leader said he wasn't happy with the idea of police officers shooting to kill on British streets, which led to a very stormy party meeting and a lot of concern in the ranks. So you tweeted, Please tell me it's not true Jeremy has just said that faced with a Kalashnikov-wielding genocidal fascist, our security forces should not shoot. Why did you tweet that? because I, along with millions of Labour voters in the country, were very concerned by the interview that Jeremy gave. But thankfully, Hilary Benn, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, clarified matters very quickly and restated Labour's support for the use of lethal force uh, and, indeed, our support for the use of drone strikes, which Jeremy had also questioned. And Jeremy himself, thankfully, a few hours later, also issued a clarification. And I'm very pleased he did. A lot of Labour voters would have been very relieved. Then came a row about the former Mayor of London, Ken Livingston, being appointed to co-chair the party's review of Trident. And the emergence of a letter from a campaign group calling for MI5 to be disbanded that the Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell seems to have signed without noticing. And we found something else interesting that John McDonnell has signed up to. This parliamentary motion he proposed last October, saying that taxpayers who don't like war should be able to opt out of paying for the military. The military's where the next battle may lie. If and when the government brings forward plans to extend British airstrikes from Iraq to Syria, some Labour MPs want to vote in favour, while their leader is a committed pacifist. One Labour figure is speaking out for the first time. I think it'd be wrong to suggest that there's a settled view on the Labour benches. Uh, people will bring their own prejudices, which are from being instinctively for intervention to having long histories of non-intervention. The only thing I would ask of all my colleagues is that we look at this with an open mind, look, examine the facts rather than seeing how it matches our prejudices and then reach a decision which is in the national interest. Do you think Jeremy Corbyn is able to do that? Because he's got some very strongly held views that we shouldn't get involved in stuff like this. And he has been consistent in that. But he may have to come to a point where he says, now that I'm not just a backbencher, I'm actually the leader of a potential party of government. There is an element of national interest. And that's really the challenge to him. For the young Corbynites at this event about Labour's economic policy this week, it's all very annoying. The only reason we look bad to the general public, the only reason that we don't look very sort of strong at the moment, is that we're not united. And if you have criticisms with the leader, you should take it up internally. It is not fitting to do these things in the press and like, like criticise people. Do you think there's actually a plot against Jeremy Corbyn? I hope not. I think um, they should, if they are planning a plot, they should probably think about the fact that Jeremy was elected with 59.5% of the vote, I think. And we saw from the beginning, he went from the least person, the least likely person to get in, to the front runner, to the person with the overwhelming majority. And if people are plotting to get rid of him, they really should listen to their party members, because the party, is, should, it should be based around what the party members want. Unfortunately for them, there's going to be another flashpoint in the next couple of days because on Tuesday there's going to be a vote in the House of Commons on Trident proposed by the SNP. Labour MPs have been instructed not to turn up, but we understand a bunch of them, including some big names, are thinking about defying their leader and voting in favour of nuclear weapons. It would be a largely symbolic vote, but another very visible symbol of Labour's issues with war and peace.
That was our Adam. I'm joined now from Doncaster by the Labour MP Caroline Flint. She was a minister under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Uh, good morning to you. Thank you for coming back on the programme. Uh, let me begin with a general question Hello. for you. It's been a pretty terrible week for Labour. What's the mood now on the Labour backbenches among your colleagues? Well, it's not been a, a great week for Labour. That's right, Andrew. And I think part of the reason for that is that we haven't looked certain and confident on some of the big issues the nation are worried about and you know what we have to have from the leadership not just jeremy but those around him is certainty about you know what do we think about what's happening in terms of uh, the terrorist acts in paris but more widely about what the certainty we can offer as a Labour Party about how we will support our national security. And I think, you know, understandably, uh, there have been concerns, I don't think just on uh, the back benches of the Labour Party, but also amongst the Shadow Cabinet, that's clear, but also, I think, what more widely amongst the party membership as well. Well, as you say, I mean, the news has been dominated for a week now by these terrible events in, in Paris. Uh, has Mr Corbyn mishandled the Labour response to these events? I think what's really important here is that um, with leadership, you know, does come a, a massive responsibility to speak clearly and with certainty about a whole number of issues, but probably more than any other uh, subject area, if you like, national security demands that because, you know, at a time when we're all reeling from what's happened in Paris and there is no doubt that Jeremy Corbyn takes very, very seriously what has happened there and its implication for the security of British people as well and others around the world. I think from the question on about allowing our police through the legal framework that already exists to take action when they're presented with a terrorist in front of them, but also on some of the other matters about how we should move forward uh, in a united way with other countries to tackle ISIL, uh, I think that certainty has been wanting and not helped, I have to say, when, you know, other members of the Shadow Cabinet can't speak with one voice uh, about what the leader wants to do. Now, I hope out of this week we will see uh, some clarity and certainty coming forward. And I think, you know, we already know, and I've heard more this morning, that Cameron is going to come back to the House of Commons next week. We do need a plan. It can't be just about military action. It has to be more than that. And I hope we can be in a position uh, to offer unity going forward to tackle the threat of ISIL, which is, you know, the most major threat to security around the world that we have at the moment. If Mr Cameron comes forward with the, the kind of plan that you've indicated he should, uh, would you back uh, military action in Syria? Um, I believe there can be a case for military action in Syria. Um, we are facing the most, um, the most profoundly um, uh, barbaric group of terrorists that I think you know, I've ever realised in my lifetime or thought about, but also the most resourced terrorist group in the world. And that does require, I think, to look at military action. Uh, it's a very different situation to what we faced a few years ago, where I voted against military action uh, when Cameron came back to Parliament to deal with Assad. We have within this country and within this region a number of very dangerous people and groups, but there are a hierarchy of dangers, and for me, ISIL is at the top of that list. So if we can have a plan that is about us working with others, and the UN Security Council resolution is helpful with that, it's something to build on, if it can be about, yes, what sort of military action we should take place, maybe the airstrikes cover like we already support in Iraq, but within that, a wider plan for how we're going to deal with the civil war in Syria and what else we need to do uh, going forward, then that's something I feel I could support. You say that, that there's no doubt that the Labour leadership takes these matters seriously, but uh, can I point out that just before the election this year, Labour's uh, shadow chancellor appended his name to a document supporting the abolition of MI5 and disarming the police. Now we learn this morning that last year he supported people opting out of having their taxes fund any kind of military activity. I don't think, I suspect a lot of people won't think that's taking these issues seriously. Is Mr McConnell fit to hold the second most important position in the shadow cabinet? 
One of the aspects of uh, the leadership campaign over the summer was a, a sense that Jeremy was authentic and very clear about his, his views. And, uh, you know, they may not be shared with everybody. I may have some different views to Jeremy on that. But part of his appeal was that authenticity, that it was unspun. And, you know, for John McDonald's, has said he didn't quite realise what he was doing when he held up the letter and seemed to support it. But I think what's really important here is that, uh, look, we had a leadership election, there was a massive surge in our membership, and Jeremy had an overwhelming mandate. Right. And, you know, maybe, you know, Jeremy and, jo and John McDonnell have earned the right within that to put forward their views. What is clear to me, look, I'm a moderate politician, but I'm also a conviction politician. Uh, I don't say one thing to one group of people and another to well, another group of people. But, and if the leadership believe in these things, then they should say that. And the biggest test is then to let the British tea people determine whether they agree with them or in, not. Indeed. But I think clarity, authenticity and honesty is very important. And that's how you create trust. Well, at the last election, clear at the end with the result that your party had a problem um, over an issue of economic security. Uh, when you take what Mr. Corbyn has said about not shooting terrorists and his reservations about the killing of Jihadi John, you add in uh, Mr. McConnell's recent policy, position, policy positions, is there not a danger, as some polls suggest this morning, that voters are likely to conclude that Labour isn't fit for purpose when it comes to national security, not just economic security? When it comes to leadership, as you know, Andrew, you have, may have your own views that you have before, but you have to be open to actually other views as well. And that's why we're having this debate, I think, within the Parliamentary Labour Party about how we come to a position about what we do next regarding ISIL in Syria. And Jeremy has a mandate, an overwhelming mandate, but with that comes responsibility of leadership to show that the ideas that he puts forward and the answers to these really difficult questions, whether it's on the economy or national security, can also reach out beyond the Parliamentary Labour Party, and to that matter, the Labour Party, to the British people and where they stand. Because part of leadership is winning people's trust and confidence to back you. And right. that's the task, not just for Jeremy, it's been the task for any leader of the Labour Party, and he needs to show that he will do that. Now, I think he wants to do that. They have said this week already, uh, this morning, sorry, they've said this morning that they're going to have a full discussion in the Shadow Cabinet. There's going to be discussions within the Parliamentary Labour Party as well. But, you know, leadership does require that wider reach and responsibility beyond our own party boundaries. Well, are you surprised, though, that in so many personal appointments, John McDonnell, Shadow Chancellor, Andrew Fisher on policy, Seamus Milne on media, Ken Livingston now on defence, that Mr Corbyn seems to have made no effort to reach out to the centre of your party, much less the right of it. Well, all party leaders, I have to say, and I've seen a few, do tend to sometimes surround themselves not only with the elected politicians, but also the paid staffers who are part of their group. But for any party leader, whoever they appoint, Andrew, they have to show that they're going to work in a way that isn't just fashioned by their own particular background and experience and maybe their own point of view, because there is a wider responsibility here. The Labour Party is not a pressure group. Uh, we exist to do, win elections in order to put our platform into practice in government. And therefore, you know, the people around Jeremy who is appointed they have to demonstrate that they understand the responsibilities of that, the responsibilities to the wider Labour Party, some people within it who may not agree with them on everything, but at their heart, we all want to win the next election. But importantly, you know, 400,000 people took part in the leadership election. That is amazing. We have had a groundswell of people join our party, and many of whom want to be active in a very positive way, and I welcome that. All right. But we have to convince millions of people to support us in the next general election and in all the elections up to 2020. And mm -hmm. the leadership and their team have a responsibility to show that they can help us achieve that. Final question to you. If Mr Corbyn continues the way he has begun, will he be leading your party into the 2020 election? And does he have any chance of winning? 
Uh, look, we've had, uh, what, is it seven, eight, nine weeks since the leadership election. It's been a bit rocky along the way. I think we made significant uh, uh, impact when it came to the debate around tax credits mm. for working people. Um, will he, will he lead your party weeks, into the next election? And last week has been difficult. What, what Jeremy will has to do now is focus on how he leads our party right now, because that will determine our fortunes in the weeks, months, but also in 2020. Right. Karen Flynn, thank you for joining us from Doncaster.